Dear people watching and listening, kindly subscribe to my channel and turn on the notification. Kindly say the durood to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ala ali Muhammadin kama sallayt ala Ibrahim wa ala ali Ibrahim innaka hamidum majid. Allahumma barik ala Muhammadin wa ala ali Muhammadin kama barik ta'ala Ibrahim wa ala ali Ibrahim innaka hamidum majid. Start of part 3. Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam The Greatest Start of Chapter 1 Everybody's Choice وَإِنَّكَ لَعَلَىٰ خُلُقٍ عَظِيمٍ And most certainly thou, O Muhammad, art of most sublime and exalted character. The Noble Qur'an Surah Kalam Chapter 68 Verse 4 how the topic arose. About ten years ago, a distant cousin of mine, Mr. Muhammad Mahtar Faruqi, gave me a typed quotation by the French historian Lamartine. The quotation purported to prove that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the prophet of Islam, was the greatest man that ever lived. Mr. Mahtar was in the habit of passing information on to me believing that I might put the same to some good use at the proper time and place. Before this, he had presented me with the call of the minaret, an expensive book written by Bishop Kenneth Cragg. By analyzing this book, I discovered the masterful deceit of the Christian Orientalists. The Martin's tribute to our Prophet inspired me, and I had a great desire to share his thoughts about our Nabi with my Muslim brethren. The opportunity to do so was not long in coming. I received a phone call from the Muslim community in Danhauser, a small town in northern Natal, who were organizing a birthday celebration of the Holy Prophet. They invited me to give a lecture on that auspicious occasion, so I deemed it an honor and a privilege. I readily agreed. When they inquired, in view of their advertising needs, as to the subject of my lecture, I suggested on the inspiration from Lamartine, Muhammad the Greatest, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Repeated Letdowns On my arrival in Danhauser, I noticed a lot of posters advertising the meeting, which in essence said that Didat would be lecturing on the subject Muhammad the Great. I was somewhat disheartened and on inquiring was told, that the change in the title was due to a printer's error. Some two months later, I got another similar invitation, this time from the Muslim community of Pretoria, the administrative capital of South Africa. The subject I had mooted was the same, Muhammad, the greatest, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. To my dismay, the topic was again changed to Muhammad, the great. Identical reasons and excuses were given. Both these incidents happened in South Africa, my own country. But let me give you one more example of our inferiority complex, so much part of the sickness of the Ummah. USA, no different. On my lecture tour of the mighty United States in 1977, I discovered that our soldiers in the New World also had feet of clay. Out of the many sad experiences I have had, I think that this one will suffice to prove the point. The Muslims of Indianapolis were advised to organize a lecture for me on the subject, what the Bible says about Muhammad. They agreed to advertise just that, but their timidity did not permit them to do so. They thought the topic was too provocative, so they, in their wisdom, toned it down to a prophet in the Bible, a lifeless Insipid title, you will no doubt agree. Which Hindu, Muslim, Christian or Jew would be intrigued to attend? What does a prophet mean? To most, a prophet means any prophet. And who would be interested in attending a meeting where just any prophet in the Bible was debated? 
Job, Joel, Jonah, Ezra, Elisha, Ezekiel are just a few of the many mentioned in the Bible. As was to be expected, the attendance left much to be desired. Inferiority Complex What is the cause of this sickness? This inferiority complex? Yes, we are an emasculated people. Dynamism has been wrung out of us, not only by our enemies but by our own spiritless friends. We even dare not repeat Allah's own testimony regarding his beloved. And most certainly thou, O Muhammad, art of most sublime and exalted character. The Noble Qur'an, chapter 68, verse 4. The most influential. Normally, it is quite natural for anyone to love, praise, idolize or hero-worship one's leader, be it a guru, saint or prophet, and very often we do. However, if I were to reproduce here what great Muslims have said, or written about our illustrious prophet. It could be played down as exaggeration, fancy or idolization by the skeptics and the opponents of Islam. Therefore, allow me to quote unbiased historians, friendly critiques, and even avowed enemies of that mighty messenger of God, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. If the tributes of the non-Muslims do not touch your hearts, then you are in the wrong faith. Opt out of Islam. There is already too much dead wood on the ship of Islam. In recent times, a book has been published in America titled The Hundred, or The Top One Hundred, or The Greatest Hundred in History. A certain Michael H. Hart, described as a historian, mathematician and astronomer, has written this novel book. He has searched history, seeking for men who had the greatest influence on mankind. In this book, he gives us the hundred most influential men, including Ashoka, Aristotle, Buddha, Confucius, Hitler, Plato, and Zoroaster. He does not give us a mere chart of the topmost 100 from the point of view of their influence on people, but he evaluates the degree of their influence and rates them in order of their excellence from number 1 through to number 100. He gives us his reasons for the placing of his candidates. We are not asked to agree with him, but we cannot help admire the man's research and honesty. The most amazing thing about his selection is that he has put our Nabi Kareem, the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, as number one, the first of his hundred, thus confirming unknowingly God's own testimony in his final revelation to the world. لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا Most certainly, you have in the Messenger of Allah an excellent pattern of behavior. The Noble Qur'an, Surah Ahzab, Chapter 33, Verse 21 Jesus, peace be upon him, Number 3 Heart placing the Prophet of Islam as number one has naturally pleased the Muslims but his choice has shocked the non-Muslims, more especially the Jews and the Christians, who consider this as an affront. What? Jesus, peace be upon him, number three, and Moses, peace be upon him, number forty. This is for them very difficult to stomach, but what says heart? Let us hear his arguments. Since there are roughly twice as many Christians in the world, it may initially seem strange that Muhammad has been ranked higher than Jesus. There are two principal reasons for that decision. First, Muhammad played a far more important role in the development of Islam than Jesus did in the development of Christianity. Although Jesus was responsible for the main ethical and moral precepts of Christianity, insofar as these differed from Judaism, St. Paul was the main developer of Christian theology its principal proselytizer and the author of a large portion of the New Testament. Muhammad, however, was responsible for both the theology of Islam and its main ethical and moral principles. In addition, he played the key role in proselytizing the new faith and in establishing the religious practices of Islam. Michael H. Hart in his book, The Hundred, pages 38 and 39. Paul, the founder of Christianity. 
According to Hart, the honor for founding Christianity is to be shared between Jesus salam, and St. Paul, the latter he believes to be the real founder of Christianity. I cannot help agreeing with Hart. Out of the total of 27 books of the New Testament, more than half is authored by Paul. As opposed to Paul, the Master has not written a single word of the 27 books. If you can lay your hands on what is called a red letter Bible, you will find every word alleged to have been uttered by Jesus alayhi salam in red ink and the rest in normal black ink. Don't be shocked to find that in this so-called Injil, the Gospel of Jesus, over 90% of the 27 books of the New Testament is printed in black ink. This is the candid Christian confession on what they call the Injil. In actual confrontation with Christian missionaries, you will find them quoting 100% from Paul. No one follows Jesus alayhi salam. Jesus alayhi salam said, If you love me, keep my commandments. The Holy Bible, John chapter 14, verse 15. He said further, Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. The Holy Bible, Matthew chapter 5, verse 19. Every Christian controversialist you question, do you keep the laws and the commandments, will answer, no. If you ask further, why don't you, he will, if he is a Bible thumper, invariably reply, the law is nailed to the cross, meaning the law is done away with. We are now living under grace. Every time you prod him with what his Lord and Master Jesus had said, he will confront you with something from Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, etc. If you ask, who are they? You will hear, Paul, Paul, Paul. Who is your master? You question, and he will say, Jesus. But he will ever and anon contradict his own Jesus by his Paul. No learned Christian will ever dispute the fact that the real founder of Christian is St. Paul. Therefore, Michael H. Hart, to be fair, had to place Jesus in slot number three. Why provoke your customer? This placing of Christ in the number three spot by Michael H. Hart poses a very serious question for us. Why would an American publish a book of 572 pages in America and selling in America for $15 each go out of his way to provoke his potential readers? Who will buy his books? Surely not the Pakistanis and the Bangladeshis, neither the Arabs nor the Turks. Except for a few copies here and there, the overwhelming number of his customers will be from the 250 million Christians and the six million Jews of America. Then why did he provoke his customers? Did he not hear the dictum, the customer is always right? Of course he did. Then why his daring choice? But before I close this episode of Heart, I will allow him to make his one last apology for his temerity. My choice of Muhammad to lead the list of the world's most influential persons may surprise some readers and may be questioned by others but he was the only man in history who was supremely successful on both the religious and secular level. Michael H. Hart Who were history's great leaders? Time, July 15, 1974 The world-famous Time carried the above rubric on its front cover. Inside the magazine were numerous essays as to what makes a great leader. Throughout history, who qualifies? Time asked a variety of historians, writers, military men, businessmen and others for their selections. Each gave his candidate according to his light, as objectively as is humanly possible, depending on one's own awareness and prejudice. Who knows Dr. Salazar? It is my habit and pleasurable duty to take non-Muslims on a guided tour of the largest mosque in the Southern Hemisphere, the Juma Masjid, Durban. On one occasion, I was hosting a Portuguese couple, a husband and wife team. At some stage during the discussion, the Portuguese gentleman said that Dr. Salazar was the greatest man in the world. I did not debate the point with him, as I personally knew little about Dr. Salazar 
except that he was a one-time dictator of Portugal, all by to many a great benefactor to his nation. My poor visitor was, however, speaking according to his own knowledge, point of view, and prejudice. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam cannot be ignored. Among the contributors to the time, it seems that none could ignore Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. William McNeil, a United States historian of the University of Chicago records, if you measure leadership by impact, then you would have to name Jesus, Buddha, Muhammad, Confucius, the great prophets of the world. McNeil does not go into details, nor does he give us any explanation as to why he placed Jesus first and Muhammad number three. Perhaps it was by force of habit. It is very likely that McNeil is a Christian. However, we will not argue with him. Then comes James Gavin, described as a United States Army man, a retired lieutenant general. He says, Among leaders who have made the greatest impact through ages, I would consider Muhammad, Jesus Christ, maybe Lenin, possibly Mao. As for a leader whose qualities we could most use now, I would choose John F. Kennedy. The general does not say much more, yet we have to salute him. It calls for tremendous fortitude to pen the name Muhammad before that of Christ. It surely was no slip of the pen. Jules Masserman, United States psychoanalyst and professor of the Chicago University, gives us, unlike the other contributors, the basis for making his selection. He gives us his reason for choosing his greatest leader of all times. He wants us to find out what we are really looking for in the man, the qualities that sets him apart. We may be looking for any sets of qualities, as in the case of Michael H. Hart, he was looking for a person wielding the most influential. However, Messerman does not want us to depend on our fancies or prejudices. He wants to establish objective standards for judging before we confer greatness upon anybody. He says that leaders must fulfill three functions. Number one, the leader must provide for the well-being of the lead. The leader, whoever he is, must be interested in your welfare. He must not be looking for milking cows for his own greed, like the Reverend Jim Jones of Jonestown, Guyana, of the suicide cult notoriety. You will remember him as the man who committed suicide together with 910 of his followers, all at the same time, en masse. The United States government was on his trail and he was on the verge of being caught for certain felonies. But before they could apprehend him, he thought it was wise to eliminate himself together with all his followers so that no one would be left to testify against him. He laced lemonade with cyanide and inspired his devotees to drink it. And so they did and they all died in disgrace. In the meantime, it was discovered that the Reverend Jim Jones had salted away $15 million and stacked it in his own account in banks throughout the world. All his victims were his milking cows and he was exploiting them to satisfy his own lust and greed. Masaman's hero must be found to benefit his sheep, his flock and not himself. Number two, the leader or would-be leader must provide a social organization in which people feel relatively secure. Unlike the Marxist, the fascist, the Nazi, the neo-Nazi, the Ashkenazi, the Zionist, and their fellow travelers, Professor Masserman in his brief essay in the Time magazine did not spell this out, but his beliefs and feelings are abundantly clear. He is in search of a leader who will provide a social order free of selfishness and greed and racism, for all these isms carry within them the seeds of their own destruction. There is still with us much sorrow and sin, injustice, oppression, wrong and hate, Still does arrogance deaden conscience, rob struggling souls of even the crumbs of pity, and make of loathsome flesh and crumbling dust fair-seeming idols for worship. Still does ignorance blow a mighty horn and try to shame true wisdom. Still do men drive slaves, protesting smoothly the end of slavery.
Still does greed devour the substance of helpless ones within her power. Nay, more, the fine individual voice is smothered in the rocuous din of groups and crowds that madly shout what they call slogans new, old falsehoods long discredited. Abdullah Yusuf Ali Number 3. That this leader must provide his people with one set of beliefs. It is easy to talk of the fellowship of faith and the brotherhood of man, but in South Africa today, there are a thousand different sects and denominations among the whites, people of European descent, and three thousand among the blacks of African descent. The white churches in my country are spawning black bishops, fast, but in the first three hundred years of European conquest, they did not produce a single black bishop. Even now, the black, the white, the colored and the Indian cannot pray together in most of the Dutch Reformed churches. The hatred between the Christian sects was aptly described by the Christian Emperor Julian, who said, No wild beasts are so hostile to man as Christian sects in general are to one another. Sayyid Amir Ali in his Spirit of Islam With the foregoing three standards, Massaman searches history and analyzes Louis Pasteur, Salk, Gandhi, Confucius, Alexander the Great, Caesar, Hitler, Buddha, Jesus and the rest, finally coming to the conclusion that perhaps the greatest leader of all times was Muhammad, who combined all three functions and to a lesser degree, Moses did the same. We cannot help marveling at Masserman, that as a Jew he condescends to scrutinize even Adolf Hitler, the arch enemy of his people. He considers Hitler to be a great leader. His race, the mighty German nation of 90 million people, was ready to march to destiny or destruction at his behest. Alas, he led them to ruin. Hitler is not the question. The question is why would Masserman, as an American Jew, a paid servant of the government proclaimed to his countrymen of over 200 million Jews and Christians that not Jesus, not Moses, but Muhammad was the greatest leader of all times. Account for that. Michael H. Hart put Muhammad number one on his list and his own Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ number three. Why? Was he bribed? William McNeil considers Muhammad as worthy of honor in his list of the first three names of his. Why? Was he bribed? James Gavin puts Muhammad before Christ. Why? Was he bribed? Jules Masserman adjudges Muhammad number one and his own hero Moses a close second. Why? Was he bribed? Are we to suppose that all the glowing adulation of Muhammad was a miserable piece of intellectual legerdemain Hocus pocus. I, for my part, cannot form any such supposition. One could be entirely at a loss what to think of mankind at all if quackery so grew and flourished in the world. Yet the scoffers bemoan anyone who has nothing good to say about Muhammad or Islam as having been bribed by the Arabs. They are giving too much credit to my brethren, I repeat. It is possible, but it is improbable. During the Second World War, Norway produced only one Quisling. He was tried for treason and executed. It is unlikely that America and the Western world have just reached puberty to spawn a breed of Quislings nurtured by not petrodollars from the Middle East. Please do not demean your honest, courageous men who without fear or favor are prepared to suffer obloquy for their convictions. We must all admire them. We can now justifiably conclude that the God of mercy, who forever recognizes the sincere efforts of his servants, is only fulfilling his promise to Muhammad, his chosen messenger. وَرَفَعْنَ لَكَ ذِكْرَكَ And have we not raised high the esteem in which thou art held? The Noble Qur'an, Surah Inshirah, Chapter 94, Verse 4 Alternative Renderings a. Have we not exalted thy fame? B. And have we not raised thy name for thee? C. Have we not given you high renown? Friends and foe alike, as if by some secret compulsion are made to pay unsolicited tributes to this mighty messenger of God, 
But the Almighty enlists even the devil into his service, as he had done in the time of Jesus. Matthew chapter 4, 1 to 11. Even the devil sometimes speaks gospel truths. Professor K. S. Ramakrishna Rao, a Hindu philosopher in his book Muhammad, the Prophet of Islam, quotes the arch devil himself. Yes, Adolf Hitler to prove the unique greatness of Muhammad. The professor, like Jules Massaman, who had evaluated the Prophet of Islam on three grounds, also saw Hitler's Mien Kampf, a three-faceted jewel, a rare commodity which he found in our hero under discussion. Quoting Hitler, he says, A great theorist is seldom a great leader. An agitator is far more likely to possess these qualities. He will always be a better leader, for leadership means the ability to move masses of men. The talent to produce ideas has nothing in common with the capacity for leadership. Hitler continues, The union of the theorist, organizer and leader in one man is the rarest phenomenon on this earth. Therein consists greatness. Professor Rao concludes in his own words, In the person of the Prophet of Islam, the world has seen the rarest phenomenon on earth, walking in flesh and blood. Share the anger. Before anyone assails the professor of undue bias and bribery, let me give them a few more names of admirers of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. 1. Muhammad was the soul of kindness and his influence was felt and never forgotten by those around him. A Hindu scholar Diwan Chand Sharma in his The Prophets of the East, Calcutta, 1935, page 122. 2. Four years after the death of Justinian, A.D. 569, was born at Mecca in Arabia the man who, of all men, exercised the greatest influence upon the human race, Muhammad. John William Draper, M.D., L.L.D., in his A History of the Intellectual Development of Europe, London, 1875. 3. I doubt whether any man whose external conditions changed so much ever changed himself less to meet them. R.V.C. Bodley in The Messenger, London, 1946, page 9. 4. I have studied him, the wonderful man, and in my opinion, far from being an antichrist, he must be called the savior of humanity. George Bernard Shaw in The Genuine Islam, Volume 1, Number 81936. 5. By a fortune absolutely unique in history, Muhammad is a threefold founder of a nation, of an empire, and of a religion. R. Bosworth Smith in Muhammad and Muhammadanism, 1946. 6. Muhammad was the most successful of all religious personalities. Encyclopedia Britannica, 11th edition. End of chapter 1